SpaceX is now just a matter of days away from their second attempt at launching the world's most powerful rocket into orbit. While the initial journey of the Starship may have ended with a rapid, unscheduled disassembly, we can safely say that the second orbital launch attempt will play out differently than the first. We still won't guarantee success, but we know that SpaceX has made over 1,000 changes to both the Starship rocket and the ground-based launch system that will ensure an even more exciting result the second time around. The first thing that people need to know is that this next pairing of Starship and Super Heavy Booster is an almost entirely different rocket from the one that we saw fly on April 20th. The next stack to make an attempt at reaching outer space will be the 25th build of the Starship upper stage vehicle and the 9th version of the Super Heavy launch booster. Because SpaceX uses iterative design at their Boca Chica production facility, these rockets were already built with some major upgrades before the 420 launch event happened, but in the time since then, SpaceX has learned from their past mistakes and made up to 1,000 new improvements to the Starship. Probably the most significant of those changes is the addition of something called hot staging to the Super Heavy Booster design. This is an updated and much more dramatic way to separate the two stages of the rocket once the booster has done its job and pushed the ship above the atmosphere. SpaceX had originally planned on using simple inertia to separate the rocket. They would throttle down all engines in the booster, release the clamps that hold it to the ship, and then begin flipping the booster over to push away from the upper stage. The booster has to flip around anyway to initiate a boost back burn and return to the launch site, so might as well take advantage of that momentum to separate the rocket, a very efficient and sensible way to handle it. That efficiency has been abandoned in favor of hot staging, which is a method designed to maintain the maximum amount of thrust as the rocket continues to climb towards orbital velocity. In order to hot stage a rocket, you fire up the second stage engines while the main booster is still running. The booster will throttle down, but unlike most other rockets, there will be no main engine cutoff prior to separation, so the force of the upper stage engine pushes the ship away from the booster. This eliminates any period of time where the upper stage is just coasting through space. Instead, we go very quickly from full thrust of the booster to full thrust of the upper stage. This is pretty important because first stage separation happens at a relatively low altitude where gravity and drag are still very much acting on the Starship. So any time when the engines are not running, the ship is actively being pulled back towards the surface and losing velocity. In order for Starship to make the best use of the limited fuel supply it has, it would be ideal for the ship to reach orbital velocity as quickly as possible. In order to accommodate the hot staging maneuver, SpaceX has added one additional ring section to the top of the Super Heavy booster. This new ring is perforated with vent holes that will allow the rocket exhaust to be safely released during the hot stage event, and the top dome of the booster's fuel tank has been reinforced to withstand the thrust and heat from those upper stage Raptor engines. Luckily, the stainless steel material of the Starship lends itself very well to a high heat environment. Trying a similar maneuver with an aluminum alloy booster like the Falcon 9 would be pretty dangerous if not done very carefully, but Starship will take it like a champ. Speaking of the Raptor engines, these were a primary source of failure in the first launch attempt of the Starship. From the moment SpaceX fired up the booster, three Raptor engines failed to ignite properly, and then throughout the course of the doomed flight, another five or six engines exploded in mid-air. SpaceX would later conclude that fuel leaks inside the plumbing system of the booster's thrust puck led to raging fires within the engine bay. We can see this pretty clearly from tracking cams as the booster reached its final seconds before spinning out. SpaceX says that the fire severed the connection between the engines and the ship's onboard flight computer, which led to a total loss of control over the booster. The fire in the engine bay was likely caused by inadequate shielding between each of the 33 engines. This is something that was retrofitted to Booster 7 long after it was initially constructed, but Booster 9 has been built from the ground up with reinforced shielding in the engine bay. Another thing to keep in mind is that the booster on 420 was fitted with the first ever full set of Raptor version 2 engines, and 
Since we know that SpaceX is using iterative design principles on all of their Starship components, it makes sense that the first engines they build will be the worst engines that they build, because their engineers are constantly learning and improving as they go along. So not every engine on that first booster was created equally, obviously. And while it's easy to fixate on the engines that failed, another way to look at this would be that even with a raging inferno inside the engine bay, and with all of these explosions going on in very close proximity, the majority of those 33 Raptor engines continued to function right up until the vehicle self-destructed. So the weakest engines on Booster 9 should be at least as sturdy as the strongest engines on Booster 7, and that should be good enough. Another key upgrade to the Raptor engines on Booster 9 has been the transition from hydraulic engine gimbals to electric motor controls. An engine gimbal is a mechanism that allows the nozzle to swivel around and angle the thrust in a way that helps steer the rocket. 13 of the engines on the Super Heavy booster have gimbal mechanisms, and Raptors have more range of motion than any other gimbaled rocket engine, so these are very important mechanisms. The hydraulic engine gimbal was a significant point of failure on the first Starship flight back in April. The hydraulic pressure system exploded within the first minute after launch, and that pretty much eliminated any ability to steer the rocket. In Booster 9, these hydraulic actuators have been replaced by electric motors. They are simple, screw-type motors that should be much more reliable and hopefully prevent another death spiral into self-destruction. And speaking of destruction, not only did the Starship meet an explosive demise, it nearly took the entire launch pad and tower along with it. This is one of the more talked about results of the first flight attempt, because it is pretty normal for a rocket to fail on its first launch. Usually, they don't explode in mid-air, but most new rockets do fail to reach orbit on their first test run. However, no rocket before has ever left behind a crater in the ground like Starship. We are looking at something in the neighborhood of 14 million pounds of force exerted onto a slab of reinforced concrete. Now that sounds like an obvious fail, but to give SpaceX full credit, they did use the strongest concrete in existence, and they didn't think that the slab would fully survive the launch, but they also didn't think it would shatter and allow the thrust from the booster to dig a hole and send big shards of concrete flying out in all directions like cannonballs either. And luckily for SpaceX, even in the midst of that carnage on the ground, the only thing that was really destroyed was the concrete slab, oh, and a minivan and a bunch of cameras. But the highly complex orbital launch mount and the gigantic robotic launch tower remained intact. This was a major break for SpaceX. Not only is Starship totally unlike any other rocket, but the launch infrastructure that it requires is also unlike any other launch pad. Elon Musk has said before that the ground system is actually more valuable than the rocket. They can rebuild a ship and booster in a matter of weeks. Those are expendable, but losing the ground systems would be a worst case scenario. Because the launch mount and tower are so integral to Starship, you'll often hear to them referred to as stage zero. Most rockets are either two stage or three stage, and that just refers to how many times they separate from a thrust section before reaching orbital velocity. Starship is a two-stage rocket because there is only one separation event before orbit, booster is stage one, ship is stage two, but it is impossible to even get the booster fired up without stage zero because this launch mount contains most of the systems that are responsible for igniting the 33 engines. On a typical rocket, these systems are located inside the booster, but in an effort towards maximum efficiency and weight saving, SpaceX has made this an outboard system and built it into the launch mount. And then, obviously, there is the gigantic steel launch tower. The Mechazilla with its iconic robot chopstick arms, not only is this an important system for lifting and stacking the booster, but it also provides an umbilical connection to fuel the upper stage separately from the booster, and eventually, if all goes well, those chopstick arms will be catching rockets in mid-air. Anyway, to ensure that there is no repeat of the cratering event from the first launch, SpaceX has installed a totally new and unique suppression system underneath Stage Zero. According to Elon Musk, this is an idea that had been in the works long before the first launch. It's just that SpaceX didn't have enough time to get it installed, and again, they didn't think that the rocket would dig a hole, but 
Regardless of that, the hole would have needed to be dug anyway, so it's not all bad. After picking out all of the bits of shattered concrete and mangled rebar, SpaceX went about the process of rebuilding and reinforcing the foundation of their launch mount. Once that was complete, it was time for the shower head. And yes, pretty much everything in the Starship world has a ridiculous nickname attached to it. This is just the way it is. The shower head is a sandwich of two ultra heavy duty steel plates, and in between them are channels for water to flow through. And the top plate is perforated with holes that create water jets under high pressure. Unlike your normal shower head, the water does not just shoot straight up. That wouldn't be particularly helpful in this situation. The water jets are moving in very specific angles to push the heat and steam away from the center point underneath the rocket. This is a drastic change from the typical water deluge system and flame diverter that is used underneath every other rocket. And the Starship system is vastly more complex than anything that has ever been attempted before. You see, a typical water suppression system is just a few gigantic hoses that pump out a massive amount of water into the area below the rocket, and then any resulting steam and exhaust gas is channeled down into a trench that pushes it to the side and away from the launch pad. From the engine tests that we've seen so far, SpaceX has fired the entire complement of 33 booster engines into the shower head a couple of times now, and the only result that we've seen has been a very large cloud of white steam. This is a pretty dramatic departure from the old static fire tests. Even when they were not launching at full throttle, the Raptor engines would always kick up humongous plumes of really dark dust and smoke, and it would almost always send little chunks of concrete flying in all directions. So, the long plumes of white steam are downright civilized by comparison, and they bode very well for the next launch attempt of the Starship. So how do we know that the Starship launch number two is coming shortly? Well, it's because we've seen the communication between SpaceX and the FAA that verifies the federal agency is satisfied with the changes and upgrades that SpaceX has made. Anytime that a flying machine like a rocket doesn't work the way it was intended, and especially when there is a catastrophic failure involved, the FAA has to launch an incident investigation. So it's not a big deal, it just means that the agency has to check in with SpaceX and figure out what went wrong, then work out what steps are being taken to prevent that from happening again. Elon Musk recently showed a list of 63 FAA-approved upgrades and modifications that have been made to Starship and the launch system. 57 of those are currently implemented, and 6 will apply to future launches. So, those are likely changes in the design that can't be made retroactively to an existing rocket, which means that the next Starship we see on the launch pad will already be an improvement over the existing vehicle. In early September, the FAA closed their mishap investigation into the circumstances around the Starship vehicle failure, and on October 31st, the agency announced that they had completed their safety review of the property at Starbase and the surrounding area. After one final green light from the Fish and Wildlife Services to confirm that SpaceX won't be flooding the nearby ocean and wetlands with contaminated water from the showerhead, Starship will be a go for launch. And all signs point to SpaceX moving as quickly as possible to get the rocket on the pad and in the air this month. Of course, no one can predict what's going to happen after those engines kick on, but that's the best part of this whole event. Success is far from certain, but excitement is guaranteed. P.S. We are still selling these Starship shirts and other items in our merch store. What better time to pick one up for yourself? Or if you'd like, you can earn one through our newsletter referral program. You can sign up for our newsletter at www.theteslaspace.com. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.